Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Phew. Poor Moses. I was so used to all this stuff before. Moses, God, what do you want me to do? I didn't give birth to them. These aren't really my people. Are they my people? What am I supposed to respond with? And phew, that gospel, I don't know if you've seen it, but we printed it out for you so you can reflect on it all week long if you like. <laughs> that gospel is so difficult to hear. In fact, we may actually dismiss it altogether because we do not understand it. And I want us to consider a few points that may just help us understand. First, remember this passage immediately follows last week's passage when the disciples were arguing about who is the greatest. Jesus responds by placing a child in the midst of them. We ought to focus on the most vulnerable, the most in need of care among us. Point two, Jesus speaks in the hyper-exaggerated ways in the following paragraph, trying to get his disciples to be um, a little more self-reflective. But I want to caution us, do not take that literally. Do not go maiming yourself, removing your eyes or your hands or your feet. Point three, why does Jesus end the teaching with describing salt? Why does he connect salt to peace? So point one, Jesus has a child on his lap. So when our passage begins with John saying something to Jesus, I hear John's interruption as furthering the curiosity about his or her importance. It's no longer an in-group disagreement of who's the greatest, but Aren't we all pretty great? Isn't St. Paul's pretty great? He says, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Remember a few disciples tried to exercise a demon just a few moments before, but they couldn't. So there might have been a little jealousy there, but they tried to stop this guy since he was not one of us. Now, you may be sitting there in your pew or in your chair thinking, I'm not, I don't really resonate with that. I don't want to be the best or, I mean, I resonate with competing with my peers to be the best. But I wonder if this us and them mentality may still trip us up sometimes. Americans versus the rest of the world. Us who speak English fluently or more clearly. Us with money or us without money. Us homeowners. And the list just goes on. Just in my household, it's, but I tried to open that jar five times before you just came in and opened it with ease. What is Jesus' response? Whoever is not against us is for us. Whoever is not against us is for us. This is a little different from whoever is not with us is clearly against us. Or if you're not in, you're definitely out. Jesus, he, he enlarges the us. He expands the possibility of good just because, or just, just beyond the designated chosen ones. He continues to say, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. Jesus is pretty practical. That person who's casting out demons, great! 
Someone recognizes you and offers support and encouragement, even if they don't look like us, let them be. No need to be jealous. No need to argue. No need to compete. And this goes to the second point. Jesus speaks in these hyper-exaggerated ways in the next paragraph, trying to get his disciples to be a little more reflective. Let us take a moment to listen. Jesus is talking about the ways we can often get in the way of someone else's healing, someone else's experience of God, or their own inclusion from God's kingdom. We, we are not to be stumbling blocks for the most vulnerable. He goes on to offer explicit images of amputating our parts, parts of our body. Again, please do not take that literally. But uh, let us take it seriously. Having a maimed body would have excluded a Jew from the temple. And Jesus says, it would be better to be maimed and excluded from your house of worship than to get in the way of offering someone respect or acknowledging someone's dignity. Jesus is trying to expand the disciples' thinking, which is so human. I can relate. This unquenchable desire to be better than others. I don't think I do it on purpose. And so we may say that today. I'm not trying to be better than other people. I get that we should center the most vulnerable around me. I volunteer. I donate. I do these things. I know. I don't hold to an us and them mentality. Yet, if I'm honest... I know I draw lines, like how John was trying to distinguish himself and their entire group. As a person of faith, as one who prays, I draw a line with, oh, I engage with a, with a growth mindset. I'm pretty open-minded, unlike some other people who aren't. Maybe as one who lives in the Bay Area, subscribes to certain values, I draw lines, and I wonder if you do too. Jesus suggests that these are the very stumbling blocks, these lines, these are the very stumbling blocks that get in our own way. And God's kingdom goes beyond what team you root for, what church you go to, what you've been given to share. Living as if our way is the only way or the right way, perhaps even our pride, our fear, sometimes even our busyness, our prejudice and our anger, all of these and more can get in the way of what God wants to teach us. And really, as you all know, particularly throughout this pandemic, as you've studied a little more and Awakenings have happened left and right. The greatest stumbling blocks are systemic. Our mass incarceration system, our red-lined neighborhoods, our consumerism that uses people as a means of getting ahead or getting more. This passage is intense today. Maybe a bit too much. Maybe a bit too over the top. Which is why the third point can be helpful. Why does Jesus end this teaching with describing salt? Why does salt, or why does he connect salt to peace? We all understand that when we pour a little salt on food, it preserves. That salt enhances perhaps even the flavor of food. Could he be suggesting that when we uplift ourselves and one another 
We are encouraged to live peacefully without stumbling blocks with one another. <laughs> now the beauty of the passage from the book of James. Are any among you suffering? Pray. Are any among you sick? Call all the elders of the church and have them pray over you. The prayer of faith will save the sick and God will raise all of us up. So my friends, let us recognize our own need for God so that we can grow in awareness and compassion for how else others may need this God who is ever expanding this circle of care. May we be counted among the people who get out of God's way to make that happen for ourselves, our communities, for the entire world. Amen.